This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with Dr. Adam Kelly. He discusses his work into talent identification and some of the key principles within this field, some unique ways of addressing the quartile balance implemented in such sports as squash, as well as the effects of the EPPP on football in the UK. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Right, Adam, weirdly, the the uh, electronic world tried to get us on Skype, which neither of us been on for about 20 years, but we're here now on Zoom. So, um, yeah, how are things, your end? Are you all good? Yeah, brilliant, thanks. Uh, plenty going on at the moment um, and looking forward to the Christmas break. So, yeah, all good. Yeah, just around the corner. So obviously, for everyone, would have been a long 2023. So, uh, just at the point to be able to have some well and rest for everyone, I'd imagine. But uh, excited for this podcast, I think, came across your work online um, and, you know, seeing some some academic research that came up against specifically around uh, talent identification and development, which is a space I know will, will resonate with a lot of people. For people that maybe haven't come across your work, do you just want to give us an overview of, of who you are, what you do and how you got to that point? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. Excited to have this chat as well. And during our briefing, chatting about how our interests align us. Yeah, looking forward to it. In terms of my personal background, um, I've been working full time in academia now for seven, eight years. Um, I'm a senior lecturer uh, in sports coaching and physical education at Birmingham City University. I'm also a researcher in the discipline of talent identification and development, ranging across various different sports, but most specifically, I guess, uh, football. Um, so my background growing up, I was an academy player at Exeter City Football Club and released at 16 for being too small um, to make it. So I guess my journey has been unique in terms of not necessarily quite making it, but then playing professionally regardless at, at non-league level, first at Salisbury and then various different non-league clubs uh, like St. Paul Town, Truro City, Weymouth. Um, but alongside that, studying um, my undergrad, master's and then PhD at the University of Exeter and looking specifically at the um, talent development process within Exeter City Academy uh, whilst working there as the head of Academy Sports Science um, and gain various different knowledge and experiences whilst whilst working there and um, yeah, made the plunge into full-time academia around seven, eight years ago. Um, which I'm really enjoying and working with various different partners, national governing bodies to try and create more equitable talent pathways, as well as trying to widen the pool of potential talent and create the most appropriate learning environment for every player to try and achieve their potential. Nice. I think we, we, we will definitely touch on the uh, process part because I think that's really interesting and maybe something historically that's that's been lacking within within football academies. I know EPPP, that's something they've tried to to um, discuss or out, however you want to put that. Um, I think that um, we've had a few guests on here before that have discussed, I guess, the talent identification piece. So Joe Baker in particular was quite critical around the idea of talent identification, particularly in the younger ones. We've had Megan Hill, who's discussed, I guess, relative age effect and how this can affect players. But if we use that as a, as a starting point, for, for you, what, I guess, does talent identification, when it's done well, look like? But what does it also look like in reality? Because I'd imagine there's a disparity between those two things. Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually work quite closely with Joe. So I guess some of our interests and responses to this sort of question might align. I also a big fan of um, Megan Hill's work, particularly around the, the growth and maturation stuff that she's been doing. Um, but yeah, I guess it comes back to the conversation around performance versus potential which is a bit of a hot topic at the moment. I guess when we're identifying players, the sole purpose or the main purpose is to identify those who could achieve expertise within the sport. Um, so who 
are they predicting is going to be a professional athlete for their team or maybe even go on to even better teams at, at adulthood. So the further back you go from adulthood, i.e. the younger you get with your selection, I guess the less accurate you're going to be during those predictions and selection processes. So one of the things I would probably say is the younger you go in, the less likely you are going to be able to accurately identify someone who's going to achieve professional status. But also considering the knock-on effect that it may have on those who aren't selected as well, such as like demotivation, lack of confidence, or creating the perceptions for themselves that they're not as good. And it's not necessarily just them who are creating those perceptions. It's also the coaches who are basically saying to a player they're not good enough uh, to be in an academy or, or whatever talent pathway it is. Um, but also their parents as well. Their parents will re- almost recognise that their son or daughter is not good enough. So, yeah, I think there's knock-on effects, uh, particularly at the younger levels, when you are selecting players because it has the opposite effect when they are selected. They get higher levels of confidence. Parents, coaches, peers think they're the best player. So, yeah, the main thing for me is the younger you go, the less likely you are going to be in accurately identifying potential talent. Um, And it goes back to that question I said about, like, identifying potential over performance. And for me, it's almost like looking into a crystal ball, identifying those who have potential. But that's essentially what we're trying to identify. Um, But from a talent identification perspective, we're often using markers of performance to identify those who have the potential. But I think they're completely separate things. And I guess that's why we see such high levels of relative age effects and maturation biases within um, talent pathways, because essentially those who are relatively older or those who are early and maturing are often the best performers on the pitch. And therefore, those are the ones who get identified as being the best players. But for me, I don't think it necessarily means they have the most potential. Um, So how can we actually create a system whereby we can identify those who have the greatest potential over those who have the greatest performance. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting one at the younger age groups, because um, as you said, it's so far away from, from what the hopeful end, I'm going to say goal, but isn't necessarily that wish, hope, whatever you want to call it is. Why do you think it is? Why do you think, I guess, generically as a, or as a, sport and as multi-sports how everyone because everyone does it why do you think we do such a crap job of uh, not being able to differentiate between potential and performance yeah I, I don't think it's fair to say we do a crap job maybe um I think everyone or most people are in it for the right reasons because they want to try and um identify those who have got the potential and help them towards adulthood to be the best player they can be I think most coaches recognise that not all players are going to make it either. And there's a lot more around player welfare and, and education, additional support within some of these pathways, which is becoming much better. But in terms of um, identifying performance over potential, I think a lot of it is driven through the adult stakeholders. So firstly, the competition formats that we have. So if we have a... Uh, national under 12 competition to see who is the na- under 12 national champions naturally coaches and clubs are going to pick their best team who is going to win that tournament they're not going to put out the team who has the most potential in the longer term because the, they're not going to win the tournament uh, because they're not going to necessarily be the best players so for me I think firstly the emphasis on competition is one thing that exacerbates these these things. And I think it's easy to say, oh, we don't focus on winning, we focus on development. But I don't necessarily think that is the case because the players that are being selected are the ones who are the best players who are going to win the competitions. Um, So it's a really hard thing to try and almost shift the culture. But at the same time, we don't really know what potential looks like either. So how can we encourage coaches, practitioners or selectors to select those who've got the most potential when we don't know what it is? Um, 
I think we had a really interesting conversation during the briefing around relative age effects and how can academies like think outside the box with regards to selection but when you look at those players who are being selected in I think it was around 45 percent of the under nine academy players across the country in England were born just in those first three months of the year so for me you're identifying relatively older players who are good performers you're not identifying players necessarily who have the long-term potential so yeah um adult stakeholders and the emphasis on competition is one thing i think parents are obviously um another thing around um pushing children in certain directions um, which can have a negative impact but again i think if you flip it around and use parents the other way, they can be like real facilitators in the journey as well. And again, I think a lot of academies are supporting parents within those journeys as well in terms of recognising that their son or daughter might not, or the likelihood is that they might not make it as a professional athlete, but how can they demonstrate that care and support during that process? Um, so a lot of it comes down to the organisational structures that we create as adults rather rather than the children themselves and so one of the things you you picked up on there was around I guess not knowing what potential necessarily looks like is there any markers that we have of people that have gone on to do well or historical data or just generically some underlying things that we think actually do help that may be a better gauge than current performance that I guess processes can revolve around or people can revolve work around. Yeah. And again, a really interesting question. Football for me is really unique in terms of, I think it's hugely multi-dimensional and complex in comparison to maybe some other sports. So for example, basketball, you are going to have to be in 95% of cases over six foot five as a male to be a professional basketball player. And then if you base that on the national norms, the likelihood is that you're not going to make it if you're below that. So in comparison to, say, gymnastics or um, being a jockey, being a jockey, you're going to have to be really light. You're going to have to be a certain height in order to be able to race quicker. So if you're not below a certain height, you're not going to be a professional jockey. So for me, football is unique because the athletes come in all different shapes and sizes um in terms of height but you firstly are going to have to be an athlete in the contemporary game um so looking at it holistically from a physical perspective getting into an academy you need to be either relatively older or more mature in order to be selected in the first place so if we're thinking about markers of potential, I think we need to try and almost change that proxy and gather that data to then benchmark players based on their relative age or um, biological age and not necessarily compare them to their chronological age group peers. And that will be really useful markers of potential because you'd be comparing you know, the birth quarter fours within each other or not and not comparing the birth call ones with the birth call fours um but also one of the examples i've got we did some work with england squash and they used an approach called birthday banding and this was whereby the individual athletes were selected based on their current age and ability and not compared to their chronological peers so for example as a 10 year old on my 10th birthday i would be a birth call four and then as I move through to my 11th birthday, I slowly become older um, towards being a birth quarter one. And then on my 11th birthday, I drop back down and be a birth quarter four again. And then what they do is all the 10 year olds would play against each other. So to start with, I'd be the youngest 10 year old. But then throughout my um, year towards my next birthday, I would almost be the oldest 10 year old and then be playing against younger 10 year olds so it almost creates a non-linear pathway whereby you are the relatively oldest and youngest throughout your development so i think 
And what we showed with that data was that there was actually no relative age effects in squ the squash pathway um, throughout all age groups. And that's the first sport that I've personally examined that I found that. Um, and I think if we use such an approach to identify players based on their current abilities um, and their age, relative age and maturation, we'd be much more accurate in identifying where they are within their journey. Um, so yeah, some of the research has shown has shown that it, to get in, you need to be relatively older or, or more mature. I guess the next thing is looking at it technically and tactically. There's some some really good research that's looked at skills retrospectively, um, particularly the use of um, things like ball juggling as proxies to be able to identify potential talent. Um, slalom dribble has been useful in identifying potential um, and there's some good stuff by Daniel, Daniel Mehmet who's looked at creating different um, different in situ tests looking at um, positioning and deciding and they've been quite accurate at identifying potential um, perceptual cognitive skills as well so not necessarily just in game um tests but looking at like, video-based simulations which would obviously take away like the physical biases of age group performers um, and look at their abilities to actually accurately identify moments in a game that might happen or predict what happens next during um video video simulations um and then i guess the next the last one comes down to that say like the psychosocial skills so taking on roles of leadership um and and looking at those types of things but i think a lot of the psych outcomes will come from things like selection so if you're selected and told you're going to get into an academy all of a sudden you have higher levels of confidence and then you're if you're doing like a psych questionnaire compared to someone who's not selected um you're probably going to get higher scores so i think being selected has a knock-on effect to those sorts of things as well so it is really complex in terms of using markers of potential, but I think it all would come down to using firstly metrics of relative age and growth and maturation status before anything else and then and then go from there. Yeah, the, the psychology one's a really interesting one because uh, I've had Wayne Goldsmith on here before and he discussed, I guess, the challenges with coach education. Um, and he said that a lot of at the top level they talk about it's the psychology that often differentiates players and what makes you know okay players good and good players great and um, he said that's the thing we don't teach on coach education courses <laughs> he said we've mm. gone very scientific gone very much around you know tech tech or physical outlays but actually when we talk about resilience which we all want children to have we never do any work around that Um and I was actually listening to a, a interview with David Saki, who again, who's a, another former guest, and he was talking about some work he was doing in that space. So I'm due to drop him a message today just to ask him how he got on with it or how he's getting on with it, because nice. I would be interested to see from a process point of view if that's something that you can latch on to maybe more so than some of the other factors. There's probably a couple of bits of what you've just said that really stand out to me, though. So we'll probably dig into those. So... <coughs> sorry caught my breath there um squash uh example i think is fascinating so i think uh, the, the first question comes to me is how did they get to the decision to make that decision what was the idea behind it if, if you could elaborate at all on that i think that'd be fascinating i think it's a really nice case study of maybe how you know you, you combat the relative age effect so yeah have you got any more in, information behind that yeah, I guess um, at Birmingham City University, we've got a partnership with England Squash. So as part of their level four, um, we help support the delivery of that. And during some of those conversations, I talked about the research that I do, and they talked about some of the approaches that they use to try and combat that. Um, so I don't think they were initially aware that it moderated the relative age effects. It was more so their approach to try and identify and work with individual athletes and create more diverse learning experiences it was around eight nine years ago that they introduced this now as well and i think it's worked really well if you look at the 
uh, rankings of England squash players and the players that they produce recently becoming Olympic sport as well. So a really exciting time for them. Um, but when we look at squash, obviously it comes with those benefits of being able to identify individual athletes at that moment in time. I think it's an individual sport, so I think it's much easier to implement something like that um, because of the flexibility of you're playing with that player tonight, you're playing with that. Whereas if you think about team sports, such as like football, rugby, netball, um, you'd be moving players across, up, down all the time. Um, And one of the things that you want to try and develop within team sports as well is that group dynamics, taking on those roles of leadership um, and all those sorts of things that I think you would potentially miss if you use that type of approach. So, I don't think it's necessarily like a one size fits all when it comes to designing potential solutions around talent identification and development. So for example, birthday banding might work really well in squash and it could potentially work when the likes of badminton or table tennis. Um, whereas in timed sports, you've got corrective adjustments, which are becoming more popular in the likes of swimming and um, uh, athletics because it's a really useful way of correcting their score based on their relative age and their maturation status and their performance. So it potentially gives you a more accurate representation of their potential rather than how good they are at that moment. And I think that's a really interesting one as well, because if you think about early maturers um, within the male context in particular, that after their growth spurt, they're going to be able to run faster than those boys who haven't matured so correcting their score based on where that within their growth maturation makes sense um so what do they do in that do they just add on a certain tenth of a second or certain seconds to the score and have it as an overall band or yeah it's um it's a regression analysis i believe i've not actually done any work in this myself um but essentially they use an algorithm to predict or to readjust their time so if they were like an early maturer, you would include their maturation status, you'd include their um, their age, and then you'd base their timing off that. And it readjusts their score, which will probably give you a more accurate representation of where they are at performance-wise based on those metrics. Um, and I guess you've got other sports as well that use different banding. So if you think of martial arts, they'll often use ability-based systems. So belt color, for example, Um, boxing, we use things like weight systems or weight categories. So there's lots of other banding approaches out there that help us moderate those effects. And I think, um, yeah, obviously within football, Sean Cumming and and colleagues have done a lot of work within bio-banding as well um, to look at trying to recategorize players based upon their maturation status and I think it's been really effective in terms of giving players more diverse perspective and it's been shown to create different challenges the only thing is by implementing that within academy systems I guess it's just those players who are already selected who are gaining a further advantage by having more diverse experiences through bio banding so I guess from my perspective, I think it should be used more as a tool for talent identification. So you can see where players are at initially um, before they're selected rather than um, within the system. I'm not saying it shouldn't be used within the system at all. I think it should be, but I think if it's going to be incorporated, it should be used to try and help identify um, potential talent as well. Um, so yeah, I think football could could learn some lessons from from other sports when it comes to the different approaches that can be used. And that is the whole purpose of this podcast. Just uh, mm. see, so you know, that's why I started in the first place. But um, what what I think is is interesting, the bit you laid on to there, is the forty five percent that you mentioned at the start being under nines. When you've got people in the system, it is easier to take that into consideration. So we can play people across. You know, we do that regularly. It's like, okay, we're going to give this player an opportunity to play across an age group, be it up or be it 
down or whatever that looks like and you know we can we can block that out for six weeks i know that a lot of academies do work for like a two-month block post christmas or so january february they'll go okay this is going to be our buyer band then block and they'll go and play fixtures and stuff like that i think the challenge you have is you, you do it in that block and then what does the rest of the season actually look like and how considered considered of it are you and it might only be like you said one or two players Whereas actually the reason I, I put my ears pricked up a little bit around the squash one, I think it would highlight it more if all of a sudden you haven't got an under 11s age group. So if all of a sudden by March you're going, well, we've got no players in this age group now because all of our players are Q1s or Q2s and we're in a situation where all of them, because their birthdays are going across, um, we actually might need to be more targeted and more purposeful about going and trying to identify some of these players in these age groups and it might then lead to action um whereas at the minute it's really easy to hide and go well we can't do any more than we're doing because if we shift any more players up we can't play our games at the weekend whereas actually i guess that squash idea is quite an interesting one because it almost leverages you into having to do something about it um so yeah i think that's a fascinating way of doing it um and I like, like you mentioned there, well, the other ones, the weight classes that they use in boxing, all that type of stuff, or skill base that they use in mixed martial arts. I guess they're all ways of differentiating that you don't necessarily always pick up on and go, actually, is there ways that we could we could utilize that? So I, I think, yeah, the, 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 again, this is why I wanted to have you on because I think it, it's prompting ideas in my head now going, actually, what can I do with my kids so that I work with to maybe um challenge them in a different way and what does that look like which is which is amazing um yeah just just on that one i think there's lots of really good young coaches working with foundation phase age groups in the country doing lots of novel things i see things popping up on on twitter looking at how they're doing mixed age play how they're looking beyond football and doing different sports they're playing multiple different formats of games and I think that's really awesome. But it ultimately comes back to the age group thing where those who are getting those experiences are those who have been initially selected based on their age groups. So whilst these are great experiences, it's going to only benefit those who are selected into the academy, which we know are those who are relatively older players. So then that exacerbates that difference later down the line of who's getting the resources coaching facilities etc so yeah i think it's great that you see these things being done but at the same time we need to think who is it that's getting these additional experiences um because yeah things like mixed age play have been shown to be really beneficial for development but at the same time it's not necessarily mixed age play it's lots of q1s and q2s playing with each other with some q3s and q4s on across various ages um the other point i was going to make that like when you were talking about playing up and playing down there's a there's a really interesting example and um, i came came about i've been doing some work on playing up and looking at the differences between those who play up and those who don't as well as the perceptions of athletes who play up and i guess one of the things that we found within the sample that we looked at we looked at those who played up versus those who didn't in the FDP and the YDP and 14 out of the 15 players who played up an age group were both got one or two within the foundation phase and in the youth development phase it was nine out of 13 players who played up an age group so the perceptions and then in the second study we looked at the perceptions of athletes who played up and they had perceptions of challenge and perceptions of progress so on one hand, it's really good that we're playing them up because it's a more challenging environment. They almost become these birth court fours or birth court fives within an age group above. Um, and it might help facilitate their progress and development through through different challenge. But again, we're facilitating those challenges for the relatively older players and the perceptions that they get or created through playing up is that they're better than their age group peers so again that's going to lead to things through like confidence and motivation and how coaches think how good they are how good parents think they are but it's yeah hugely overrepresented by those who play up so 
I can agree yeah. that that perception is a hundred percent spot on as well. In in my experiences, that you know, is uh, if I'm playing up, that means that I'm um, I'm doing really well, and it doesn't matter how many times you can stand in front of a, a player group and parent group and say, "Listen, throughout the season, there will be different reasons to why your son is going to play across." the age groups and it might be physical it might be we want to give them a physical challenge and that actually from a technique and technical standpoint they're, they're struggling at the minute but we need the physical challenge it might be that they're performing well and we do want to challenge them by playing across it might be that we want them to play a different format it might be as simple as we need someone in that position and they're going to play across you can give all these rationale but it will come down to as soon as someone gets selected a uh, baron or player will go Oh, that means that they're doing well, and actually, it's it's I I particularly find it really challenging to kind of have those conversations to say that everyone's journey is very different. So if if we're playing you up, it doesn't mean that you're at the moment performing best in the group. It's it's a hit that we think you need for your longer term development. So I think the fact that you've got studies to back that up, I think is yeah. In my lived experience, having done it for fifteen years, I think it's exactly what perception is exactly what i've experienced yeah and i think it comes back to that whole age group approach that we use and all players and parents base in their comparisons of who is in that team and i think we shouldn't be comparing because we've got up to 12 months difference between athletes within that group a really interesting example of that playing up and, and playing down and stuff is um i was actually watching soccer m once and harry Maguire was on there talking about how he used to play up an age group. Um, I think his dad was manager and he had an older brother, so he used to play for that team. Um, and then John Stones did a very similar interview, but he talked about when he was at Barnsley Academy, how he was told he was going to be playing down an age group. And he talked about how he was distraught at the time and thought he wasn't good enough, but retrospectively looking back actually helped him because he had to like overcome that. Uh, like challenge of like being rejected although it wasn't necessarily him being rejected it was the coaches trying to create a more appropriate learning environment for them so despite coaches providing that information like you say I think we there's always going to be that stigma if we use these use these structures and then you look at Maguire and Stones both reached the pinnacle of England national team two centre-backs playing together at the Euros uh, in the final um, both taking two completely different journeys in order to get there in terms of playing up and playing down. So it's not a one size fits all approach and we need to think about how we can provide the most appropriate learning environment for every young player to try and achieve their potential and not just identify those who are relatively older or are more mature than their, their age match peers. Yeah, and it, I I wasn't aware of those those ones, but yeah, I think it's it's a really nice way analogy. You have got two England players there that you know different journeys have been challenged them in a, in a different way. And then one of the things you mentioned was around the the position and the de uh, decision. Sorry, hard for me to say the position and the decision making piece around um, identifying potential and stuff. So could you just elaborate more on, on what that work is? Because I haven't come across that before, and I think that's quite an interesting thread. To sorry, say, say that one again. The position and decision bit. Could you just elaborate on what that like in terms of being a identifier of potential and stuff? What that actually looks like because I haven't come across that before. Um, is the is that the Daniel Memmott stuff I mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So these are uh, game based simulations that you can create, um, and then you film them and get experts to watch them back. And essentially, you can rate the skill set of the athlete so how are they like positioning themselves and finding space in order to receive the ball um and then looking at the decision making of the athletes when they're actually on the ball as well so are they able to break lines or are they selecting the right person in the right position um so these tools can be useful to try and add to almost a battery of holistic tests to try and help you identify different skill sets so for me that's looking at someone's decision making and positioning both in possession um of the ball but also out out of possession of the ball looking to try and receive it 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'm wondering whether as part of a, a p- pathway or audit process, whether you could have some baseline, almost clips that the players go and watch and stuff and you see what they pick or choose, maybe relative to position and whether there's any value in that. Yeah, definitely. That's that's more related to the perceptual cognitive test that we were talking about. So I've done some work in that area and um, looked at those players. Sorry, players looked at 45 video simulations. And then during those simulations, the screen would freeze and they would have to select the response that the player did or the correct response. And then what we also got the coaches to do was rank the players based on who they thought had the most potential to achieve expertise um, in football. And it actually showed that these video simulation tests were accurate. Those who had higher scores within the perceptual cognitive tests were also ranked higher as the coaches of those who had the most potential. Um, The only thing with that proxy is obviously it's only based on the coach's views of what potential is. It's not actually the outcome of who achieved professional status. So in a few years time, it would be quite nice to look back at that data and see if those scores were related. Um, But there has been some other research on perceptual cognitive skills and using lab-based tests because obviously it removes some of those performance-based biases that you might see on the pitch. Yeah, no, no. That's the bit that probably fascinates me is because we always discuss about, you know, speed of thought and those players that maybe can't run as quickly as they used to. Think of a Perlo in his, his later days, can't run as quickly as he used to, but actually they're they're quick enough in the brain to be able to to oversee that. And I think that's a really nice way of doing it. I have a big theory that I think VR, VR is going to be a big one moving forward when it gets a bit more realistic in terms of what you're seeing, that actually you can reduce time on feet and you can reduce load, but you can also simulate some of the pitches that they're going to be seeing on a game day. So if we're talking about a 1v1 with a winger, you can plug into the VR that we want that winger to do these movements which look like xyz and feed it game footage of the player doing those bits of movement and now we've got this player and his job is to actually try and you know move his head move his body in the position to be able to counteract that and get an understanding of what that's going to look like and feel like before even getting onto the pitch so i think in in future that's there's going to be some training elements within that but i really like it from a i guess potential point of view is actually trying to standardize it to a degree and have a process that we're going to go through and go at some point in their journey over the foundation phase, we're going to ask them to go through this test to get a score. It's something we can keep over years and years and years and years. It's not going to be an entire thing of going to selection, deselection, but what it does do is give us another bit of identifiable data to say, he's really struggled in this area. Is there any reason we think why or, this player, whilst we always moan about their decision making, the the VAR the VR stuff or the decision cognitive decision stuff, he's actually pretty good with. So, are we missing a trick? Is it maybe something to do with this technique that is letting him down when it actually gets onto the pitch or something like that? So, I think it just rounds out and makes it more holistic when we're actually doing those audit processes. Nice, yeah. The the VR stuff's an interesting one. Um... Greg Wood at MMU is doing some good stuff in in that space at the minute and looking at it within academy football players. Um, I think it comes back to the point where we talked about like it shouldn't necessarily be like a one size fits all. So like you just said there, a player might be struggling with like their awareness or decision making. So VR might be a really useful tool for them. Whereas some another player might be have that as like a real strength. Um, so they might not necessarily need that. Um it's also thinking about like how representative is VR of the actual game of football. So having that headset on in a certain space, it may not necessarily even be transferable to, to football. So more research is definitely required in that area. But like you say, I think it could be a useful tool, um, particularly for those say going through growth and maturation, as an example, and you need to decrease their load because they, they've got article good status or something like that. So then that could almost... Um, be used as a tool to facilitate ongoing development during injury or timeout. Um, yeah, but more, more research needed. 
I think with tools like this as well, and even the stuff we were talking about, perceptual cognitive testing or video-based uh, or in-situ testing, it comes back to what is it that you're actually trying to get out of um, using these and how is it linked to the long-term philosophy and goals of the academy? Because obviously time is really at the essence for all these clubs and also how enjoyable and um, how much buy-in do, do you get from the players who are doing it as well because it all comes back to football really because the kids just just want to play so at the same time as thinking about all these novel and unique things that we could create we also need to think about the potential knock-on effects that might have on player satisfaction player motivation development etc um, yeah as you said it's a cyclical thing right like we obviously you've got footballers trying to make decisions on players but ultimately you've got to remember their kids want to play football yeah uh, so it, it is that balancing act for, for, for sure um and i i can tell you now off the back of this call i'm going to be asking you for loads of contact details of people because you already named like three or four people and i'm like oh they'd be interested to discuss that with so that'd be one that we're gonna to have to catch up with a, a, yeah. another point um I'm conscious a little bit of time, so we we haven't got too long left of what we had allotted. I think a bit of an open-ended question, this one. It could be really challenging for you, but I'm going to let you run with it as as you wish. What do you think grade A would look like? So if I said to you now, you're an academy manager, I want you to design a talent ID system and then a talent you know development position a uh, system sorry not position what would you say in your opinion from your research grade a would look like again a huge hugely open-ended question the first thing i would think about was the social cultural context so like what we would create in england would look different to what would be created in brazil and an example of that is in america or the us they've got a pay-to-play model and it's very much full of those um, athletes who can afford to play, which then narrows the potential pool of talent. Whereas a country like Brazil, um, it's a lot of players playing out on the streets and the favelas and using that as a development environment. Whereas in England, we've got like a professional academy system that's aligned to um, professional clubs. So, um, so there's lots of different um, pathways and journeys I guess if we're thinking about it from a from an England perspective or a UK perspective um, I would suggest stop identifying players in the early ages give them time to fall in love with the sport in the first place don't create perceptions both of the players who are selected and those who aren't selected which is going to start limiting the pool of potential talent and think about how you could redistribute that money or resource more widely to create more of those development opportunities for players. And you'll still have tabs on the players. And I think it needs to come from top down in terms of policy making, in terms of the ages that we can sign players or the stuff that pre-academies uh, are doing to get players in at earlier ages. Um, so for example, if you're if you're a Man City, why not govern the Manchester leagues to try and create better pitches, better facilities, better resources for a wider pool of players? And you'll know every player in that environment then as well. And then when you have a better idea of who has the potential, you can then start selecting at, say, under 11s, under 12s or whatever it is. But I think we need to really go back to our roots and think about the importance of grassroots football. And we, we've become far too professionalised at, at those younger ages. And we're almost in the opposite of like what the research has showed in terms of the need for young children to diversify, gain various different experiences um, before they start specialising. And I think we're removing that from players regardless of if you implement some sort of like multi-skills you know, component into your academy system, they're, they're still they're still within that specialised environment. Um, so the first thing I would do is 
identify players later, but also widen your pool of potential talent by creating better systems and structures within your region. And the second thing I would do is identify players based on relative age and maturation status. So how old is the player within their chronological age group? What does potential look like within that birth quarter? And also look at their maturation status. And again, what does potential look like based on their maturity status? Um, and then we'll have a better representation of, of what um, potential looks like over performance. Now, that's the real sticking point because how do you encourage coaches to select potential over performance when performance is emphasised through you know, winning competitions or being the best team in the league or, or whatever it is. Um, now, sport is competitive and I wouldn't want to remove um, certain competitions, but at the same time, we need to think about the knock-on effects of those and how we could be more flexible with our approach of grouping athletes and mixed age play and, and all those things. Um, and then you've also got to think about, lastly, by... Cre recreating new structures you may have unintended consequences as well so that might have a knock-on effect of other things that we may not have thought of um, some good examples I guess are those players who have been released from academies who have then gone on to make it so for example Harry Kane um, at Arsenal released at 12 and um, Declan Rice released from Chelsea um, and then these players have actually then gone on and been reached the pinnacle. So if they weren't released from those structures, would they have actually have made it within their respective clubs? So would have Harry Kane made it at Arsenal? Or did being released actually create some sort of psychological skill or um, whatever it is in order to overcome challenge later down the line within his development? And it's the same as the same question for Declan Rice. Um, but then on the flip side of that, there's obviously been many, many more players who have been released who have then dropped out of football or have, have not made it. So it's easy to look at it through both lenses. And yeah, it's, it's a very difficult question, but I think it all comes back to understanding who we're selecting and their relative age and their um, maturation status. So I think it's an interesting point because I know like Bayern Munich, for example, they've um, shifted the age group that they recruit up. So I can't remember if it's under 10s or under 12s, but I know they've removed some of the younger age groups. Now there's, I guess, the there's two lines of thought on this. The first is, oh, what a great president to set. And that's really good that they're going to go and do that. The second uh, food of thought is, they buy everyone at the top end of the Bundesliga anyway. So anyone who's any good, they just go, okay, we're going to have you. Thanks for thanks very much or actually it doesn't matter so they can set that president because they'll get the players further down the line anyway and there's going to be certain people i imagine listening to this or that have done work around the EPPP that are going to say well look at the results prior to the EPPP England had been terrible in major tournaments and youth tournaments now look at us in under 17s under 19s first team we're, more often than not we're doing well and players are progress progressing what would, uh, yeah, I guess that's their argument back and saying, actually, what we're doing is working. What we're doing at the, this moment in time is exhibiting good results. What would, I guess, your, your comeback to that be? Yeah, I, I think the e P was, was a great thing for English football because it almost set a regulatory framework to make sure that we're working to certain standards. Now, that's not to say everything is, you know, perfect within the system but what i think it has done is it has created a system that ensures clubs are working to certain standards um it's easy to make causation in terms of the england national team are doing this we're doing this within grassroots therefore that's the reason why um you'll see like stories that this player has been in the academy since seven eight years old and now they've made it during that journey, there would have been a lot of players who were selected and deselected at various different time points. So it's almost like saying because that player was there from that age, 
the academy is the reason why that they have made it at senior level. So we won the World Cup in 1966. The youth or academy structures then were probably non-existent, but we still had players who were good enough to win a World Cup. Um, so I don't think we can necessarily say that we're doing this because this is the reason why. I think that Utopia has been awesome in, in terms of creating that framework and you know, there's lots of jobs that have come from that, lots of opportunities for players. And I think players who enter academy systems, nine times out of 10, come out with more enriched experiences within their life than if they weren't in that academy. So, for example, me, I was released at 16 um, from my well, centre of excellence back then. Um, and I would have much preferred to have had that academy or centre of excellence experience than I didn't. I had a great coach over those four years at um, Eamon Dolan, um, unbelievable. And I learned so much off of off of him. Another coach, Tommy Wilden, again, learned so much off of off of him. And I think that had a positive impact on me and my life. So I think, yeah, it's not necessarily just about those performance outcomes. Thinking about other KPIs or metrics around like, what is it that you want to achieve for those who aren't going to make it the the 90 95 percent that aren't so personal development developing the person over the player i saw manchester united recently create that alumni program which i think you know is an awesome opportunity for those who don't necessarily make it to go down different journeys um trent alexander arnold creating that that structure and he he even talked about itself with his with his mates and during his interview talked about um you know, he was the lucky one who made it in the Liverpool Academy. But then his mates who who weren't there, they were there from eight years old or whatever, all the, through, all the way through to 21s. And then they were like, don't have anything now. Um, so again, it's, it's not necessarily a one size fits all in terms of experiences and outcomes. And yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. But to answer your question, I think EPP has been good perhaps like lift the ages a little bit and have more of a regulatory framework around children. Um, I've been looking at children's rights a lot recently as well. And, you know, how we're meeting those within our academy systems and you know, ultimately it is kids that we're working with. And we need to ensure that we, we remember that with everything that we're creating. Yeah, I think a really nice sentiment to finish on. So we'll finish there. But Adam, really appreciate your time. Um, I know we didn't touch on half the stuff we mentioned in our in our briefing things. It might be one that further down the future we catch up again. But yeah, really appreciate your time and hopefully catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.